While circuit simulation and device modeling are important subjects to bridge technology and applications, it is not clear to many people about how it is being done. Its multidisciplinary nature sometimes also prevents people from having a holistic picture on the subject. In this set of presentations, I will try to explain the methodology of circuit simulations and device modeling. In the first presentation, I will start from the simplest linear time invariant circuits and look at how to perform circuit simulations with computers. A top-down approach will be used by first explaining the circuit simulation framework before we handle the approach to perform device modeling. Before you continue to watch the video, I want to remind you that I expect you to have some circuit simulation experience with spikes. If not, you may not be able to follow the subsequent videos. To begin with, let's look at the definition of a circuit. A circuit is formed when different circuit elements that we call devices are connected to one another. An example of a circuit is given in this slide. When two or more devices join each other, they form nodes. Each device on the other hand forms a branch. In the figure here, there are three nodes that we call N1, N2, and N3. There are also four branches that are labeled as B1 to B4, corresponding to the four devices. While a device determines the relationship between the current and voltage of a branch, as shown in the picture here. Let's call the voltage across the branch VV. In a circuit simulator, each device is represented by a computer model that calculates the current through it with a given voltage applied to it. For example, in a 100 ohm resistor, I will be given by BV over 100. A device can have more than two terminals. For example, it can be a two-port network that forms two different branches with two branch currents. When devices are connected together to form a circuit, it is governed by three set of equations. The Kirchhoff Current Law, or KCL, the Kirchhoff Voltage Law, or KVL, and the branch equations that relates the current and voltage characteristics of the device. Let's go back to the circuit example we have earlier. The circuits have three sets of unknowns, the branch currents I, the node voltages V, and the branch voltages BV. KCL governs all the branch currents I so that the sum of all currents entering or leaving a node must be zero. We can write down the sum of currents at each node and requiring them to be zero. This results in three equations for the three nodes. Here, I use the convention that a current leaving a node is considered as positive. KVL governs the node voltages and branch voltages. Enforcing the difference between two node voltages across a branch must be equal to the branch voltage. We can write down the relationship between the node voltages and branch voltage for each branch, and that gives four equations for the four branches as shown here. Finally, the device model relates the branch voltage and branch current as described before. We have three sets of equations and three sets of unknown. We should be able to solve for all the unknowns. To see how to construct the circuit equations, let's use a more realistic example as shown in the figure here. The subscript of each device indicates the branch number. We first start with KCL for each node. For N1, the total current is contributed by I1, I2, and I3 only. In matrix form, we roll a 1 for the N3 corresponding to a current leaving the node. We do the same thing for N2 and write down the current components corresponding to N2. We use a negative sign to indicate the particular current is entering the node. We repeat it for N3 as well. The matrix before the current is called the node branch incident matrix, and we label it with A. Then 
the expression for the matrix equations can be written in a very compact form, which is the product of a and i equal to zero. We then write the KVL for the branches. There are five branches, so that there are five equations or five rows in the matrix form. The equations simply correlate the branch voltages and the node voltages. In a more compact form, it can be rewritten as the branch voltage vector BV, subtracting the product of the transpose of the previously defined node branch incident matrix A times the node voltage vector is equal to zero. Before we continue, we should observe that the sum of all node voltages and node currents should be equal to zero. That is, the power produced by some of the devices should be consumed by the other devices. It also means that if none of the device is a power source, all branch voltages and branch currents will be zero. From the example, you can see that the node branch incident matrix A plays a very important role in defining the circuit equations. And it is only dependent on the circuit topology. We can construct the matrix by a table with the node number as the row and the branch number as the column. Then you put down a one if the node is the positive terminal of a branch and put down a minus one if the node is the negative terminal of the branch. Besides these two cases, you put down zero in all other entries. Because each branch can only be connected to two nodes, there are exactly two non-zero entries per column. The matrix itself is singular, as there is redundancy. To prevent singularity, one of the nodes is designated as ground, and its equation is removed from the matrix. That particular node voltage is said to be the zero reference. Now, we have the KCL, KVL, and the branch equations, and we can solve for all the unknowns. There are different ways to solve the system of equations. The most generic one is the sparse table analysis, which put all three sets of equations into a matrix and solve them together. It results in a very large matrix and very time consuming to solve. A more efficient method is called the modified nodal analysis or MNA. We will focus on this approach to construct and solve the circuit equations. And this is also the main algorithm used by SPITE when performing circuit simulations. The modified nodal analysis only solves for the node voltages in the matrix solution, but not the branch currents. But the branch currents are usually easy to find using the branch equations given by the device model once the node voltages are known. To understand how to perform modified nodal analysis, it is best to use an example. We will use the same circuit we used before. In this circuit, we pick dog 3 to be the ground. So we only need to solve for the node voltages at N1 and N2. The first step in the MNA is to write the KCL for each node. And they are like what is given here. After that, we use the model equation to express the branch current in terms of the branch voltages. In the new set of equation, the unknowns are the branch voltages. Anything that are not dependent on the brand voltages are moved to the right-hand side of the equation. It is the case for the currents from the independent source IS5. Well, after that, we use KVL to substitute the branch voltages with the node voltages. The two equations become what is expressed here. We can then collect similar terms with the same variables. As there are only two nodes, there will only be two unknowns and there are two equations. They can be expressed in a matrix form, which will look like what is given here. The form is something times the voltage vector gives the current vector. Based on the unit, we know that the matrix before the voltage vector has a unit equivalent to conductance. Then we can write the matrix equation in a more compact form, 
as the branch conductance matrix Y, multiplying the node voltage vector gives independent current vector entering the nodes. The Y matrix is often called the Jacobian matrix. By looking at the matrix equation, Y and IS are known and can be assembled from the circuit elements. Then, we can solve for the node voltages directly. Let's take a closer look to the Jacobian matrix. When you add an element to the circuit, the element contributes a branch current, and it is reflected by adding a term in the Y matrix entry that it is connected to. For example, the resistor R1 is connected between N1 and N3. So, it is contributing a 1 over R1 to the equation corresponding to N1. Its contribution to N3 is ignored, as N3 is treated as graph. For R3, it is connected between N1 and N2. So, it appears in all the equations concerning N1 and N2, which are added here. Observing this property, we can assemble the Y matrix by adding the contribution of each element one by one. If you have used spikes before, you should be familiar with its input deck, which looks like what is given here. What spikes actually did is to assemble the Jacobian matrix after reading each element, where it is connected to, and its value. Understanding the method for solution, we can then design a stem for each circuit element to determine what entry to be entered to the Jacobian matrix when it is added. We will do that in the following sections. As there are many different types of circuit elements, we will start with linear time invariant circuit element first. They are basically linear resistor and linear sources. For a resistor, the spike's entry is given here with the symbol, the node for the positive terminal, the node for the negative terminal, and the value. When a resistor is added, it adds a value of 1 over R to the row and column for the positive node and the row and column for the negative node. For the row corresponding to the positive node and column for the negative node, and the row for the negative node and the column for the positive node, it contributes a value of minus 1 over R. Notice that if a node is grounded, there is no row and column corresponding to it, and no entry is required for the ground node. For a linear voltage controlled current source, the spike's entry is like what is given here. N plus and N minus in the slide are where the source is connected to, and NC plus and NC minus are the nodes where the branch voltage control is coming from. For example, in this circuit, the VCCS is I2, where N plus is node 1, N minus is ground, NC plus is node 1, and NC minus is node 2. We can look at the earlier matrix of the same circuit in the previous slides to see the contribution of I2. For independent constant current source, it is simply added to the right-hand side of the matrix equations at the rows corresponding to the nodes it is connected to. These are all the elements in the example circuit we used, and we can now check the matrix entries with the corresponding elements. But what about linear time invariant circuit elements, such as independent voltage sources and other sources listed here? To understand why these sources need to be handled differently, let's look at the following example. In this new example, we used the same circuit before and added three new elements. In particular, we have an independent voltage source, Vs6, and a voltage control voltage source, E7. The system now has four nodes, excluding the ground, and eight branches. We follow the same approach as before to write the KCL for all the nodes as the first step. In step two, we use the branch equations to replace the branch currents with branch voltages. Then we have a problem, as the current of a voltage source is not determined by the branch voltage. So 
I6 and I7 cannot be replaced by the branch voltage. In this case, we just leave this clearance as is. A new step is used to include the constraints to the branch voltages. This will add two new equations concerning the individual branch that its current and voltage cannot be expressed in terms of each other. Then, we continue the previous approach to use KVL to replace the branch voltages with the node voltages. After that, the unknowns are collected and the system of equations can be written into a matrix form. After some rearrangement, the resulting matrix equation is shown here. By observing the new matrix, we can see that it can be divided into a few parts. The first four rows and columns concern the node equations as we have before. When sources with currents as the unknown variables are introduced, each unknown current will introduce one additional variable and equation. That is, it expands the matrix by creating extra entries beyond the existing circuit matrix. Fortunately, the location of the entries and their values are easy to be identified, and a template for those elements can be constructed. And they will be given in the following slides. But I will not go into details as it has been explained before. The matrix entry for an independent voltage source is given here. For each voltage added, one additional row and column is added to the matrix. The entries for the current control current source are given here, which are similar to that of an independent voltage source. The entry for voltage control voltage source are given here, which is again very similar to what we have before. For a current control voltage source, we need to know the controlling current in order to find out the resulting current through the voltage source. Therefore, two additional branch equations have to be added to the matrix, and the matrix entry is like what is given here. From this presentation, you should get some basic understanding on how a computer uses the nodal analysis to solve circuit equations. Simple nodal analysis only solves for node voltages and cannot handle some elements like voltage sources. Therefore, the more divided nodal analysis is used to add additional state variables to the solution set. As the purpose of the more divided nodal analysis is to minimize the number of equations to be solved, it mainly solves for the node voltages. The branch currents cannot be simulated directly and need to be separately calculated using the branch equations. If you want to simulate a branch current directly, you have to add the branch current as a circuit variable into the matrix system. This can be done by inserting a voltage source with V equal to zero to the branch. And overall, you should understand that Spikes is nothing more than a linear equations or matrix solver. Before I end this presentation, I would like to give you a preview of the source codes of the resistor and independent voltage source models in Spikes. The main actions are indicated in red. They are just putting some numbers in the matrix with the locations defined by some pointers. See you in the next presentation.